With the release of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, we now have 17 DCEU films. So today, I thought it was time for me to stop and rank all 17 DCEU films right from the worst to the best. Please know that everything that I will say in this video is just my very own opinion. My name is Hesedub Nation, and you are free to comment down below your very own ranking of all 17 DCEU films right from the worst to the best just like me, or you could just do your favorite. Please don't forget to check out that Twitter, that link is in the description, as well as that DC playlist, that link is also in the description as well. Now let's rank the DCEU films one last time. Kicking off our list at number 17 is Justice League, or better yet, Justice League. Look, it's a movie that I enjoy. I still enjoy the theatrical version of Justice League, but I can't deny every single thing about this movie is worse than the Snyder Cut. It is just a gross project to line up WB executives' pockets for Christmas. It amazes me how brain dead of a decision it was to bring in Joss Whedon to finish a Snyder film, and the fact that they used his tragedy to do so. I don't blame Joss Whedon that much because he just took a job, but come on. There are so many better things in the Snyder Cut that Joss deliberately cut out for even worse scenes. 16 is Suicide Squad. I like this movie. I, I like this movie, man. I don't think the problem lies with the cast. They're great. The choice of characters are great, too. I think everyone in the cast and, and the characters are just great. If it were to get released, I think an air cut wouldn't be too different, but definitely an improvement. It's well documented that Ayer only had six weeks to write the script, and for the most part, it's showcased on screen. The story and plot are thin, but if this was an hour and 30 minute extraction story, it would have worked. And I think that first act of the film, that first leading into the second act of the film where they have to go extract Amanda Waller from the tower, if it was just that movie, I think that would have worked. But unfortunately it wasn't. But my problems don't lie within the characters, the cast, or the action. I mean, I like Jared Leto's Joker as well. My problems don't even lie with him. I like this version of Joker. It's just the plotting and the story, and that all can be summed up to the fact that he only has six weeks to complete the script. 15 is Birds of Prey. I have an on and off relationship with this film. I first watched it and liked it back in 2020. Then for the last two years, I didn't like it. I kept having this this off feeling about it. It's just, I just didn't like the movie. And I just rewatched it earlier today, and it's fine, I guess. I wasn't bored this time. I still have the same positives. The action is great. I love the fact that it's practical stunt work and it's actually Margot Robbie doing it. They got the John Wick guys to come over here and, you know, do some of the action. And I thought it all worked out. Harley as an unreliable narrator was pretty fun. I love the fact that it is an out of order story. So like when you're watching the movie, it kind of rewinds back to scenes that kind of connects the characters together. I love those type of stories where it's all coming together. You, it, All of it comes together by the end. I think all of that was pretty great. And Ewan McGregor as Black Mask, as an eccentric villain, he works. I mean, there are a lot of positives here. Unfortunately, while there is so much to like, it is by far the most forgettable of the DCEU films. When I'm rewatching the DCEU films, I always forget, wait, there's one more that I didn't watch. There's one more that I didn't watch. And I own this movie. Literally the other night, I was looking through my DCEU films, and I was like, okay, I got every DCEU film, except for Man of Steel, in 4K Ultra HD. And then I looked again, then the one film that I don't have in 4K Ultra HD is Birds of Prey. It is by far the most forgettable of the DCEU films. Beyond a rewatch, there is no reason for me to revisit this movie. 14 is Wonder Woman 84. Everyone hates this movie, but not me. I really like it. I feel bad for those who watched Wonder Woman 84 and didn't get some enjoyment out of it. A step down from the first film, for sure, and I do find it hard to believe that everyone would just willingly give up their wishes by the end, but Gal Gadot's charm is enough for me. I love Gal Gadot. She's my celebrity crush, by the way. So, of course, I love Gal Gadot. And her and Chris Pine's chemistry is actually really great here. The 1984 setting boasts a colorful tone, which the first film was missing, in my opinion. I feel like that film just... It's very devoid of color. Mind you, it's set in like 1918. So of course, it's like a war setting. It's going to be devoid of color. But I just really love the vibrancy of the 1984 setting here. The film's action spans multiple locales as well. It does nothing offensive and plays it pretty safe. I guess you could say Patty Jenkins just had a bad day at the office, which 
We all do. Does it do some bold things and make some mistakes? Yes. But at the end of the day, I don't think that it's terrible. 13, Shazam Theory of the Gods. I enjoyed this movie when I watched it. I missed it when the release came out, so I didn't review it. But So this is kind of the first time that I'm actually talking about Shazam Theory of the Gods. And, you know, it tries. It, it tries, you know, and it goes bigger in action and spectacle and gives you more of what you got from the first film. And, you know, we have more mythical creatures. We have dragons. We have these newer villains, which these are not in the comics. I think the, these villains don't come from the comics. They're actually original characters made up for this film. And I guess for the film that they were trying to tell, these characters were needed. I still wish that we would have gotten that post credit scene in the first film paid off inside of this movie. That's neither here nor there. Look, unfortunately, there are a slew of problems. It's not as funny nor as heartfelt. While we're told Billy is turning 18, why does Zachary Levi still play Shazam like a 13-year-old boy? If he's the best thing about the first film, he's the worst thing about this one. In fact, Freddy felt more like a grown Shazam than Billy did. It felt more like Freddy's movie than it did for Billy. This movie introduced an emotional story about Billy finally accepting this family, but also being afraid of being left again because he is turning 18 and growing out of the foster system. And as everyone else grows up around him too, going off to college, going off and doing their own thing, he doesn't want to be left alone. I feel like if they would have focused more on that, it could have worked. But that plot is overshadowed with lackluster comedy and an annoying Zachary Levi. And when it comes to charm and heart, unfortunately this sequel left that out. 12 is Black Adam, a comic book film that came out 15 years too late. I mean, he was cast as Black Adam 15 years before this movie came out. And after watching it, I guess it's okay. I saw it in theaters, and I had a blast with it when I saw it in theaters. The thing that I love most about this film, obviously The Rock, but also the sheer carnage of Teth Adam. He kills so many people in this movie, and I ate it up. I ate it all up. I just loved seeing Black Adam just kill people just because like he just did it just because he wanted to and I like that I I kind of like seeing that now I don't like seeing death like in person but of course like on the screen with a character like Black Adam who just like throws a guy away like if he doesn't have what he wants well I have no use for you so I'm just gonna kill you I like that the Justice Society I had a blast with but I also questioned when I walked out of the movie and when I rewatched it why did Dr. Fate sacrifice himself for a character that can reincarnate that's his whole thing. That's the thing that makes Hawkman cool to me and Hawk Girl is the fact that they can reincarnate. So if they die, they're just going to spawn back in like a year or two later. So if he died in this movie, it wouldn't have mattered. If we would have gotten a sequel or a Justice Society movie, Hawkman was going to be in it. It was a very weird choice, but okay. While it is a spectacle, this is a bad movie. The plot is bland and the kid acting sucks. I'm content with this movie because it's exactly what I expected. But if this was a movie that we've been waiting for for 15 years, then you might want to take it back. Eleven is The Flash, a movie that had all of the critics and movie executives hype about it. I mean, everyone hyped this film up as one of the best comic book movies, and it bombed so hard. But I can't lie, I really liked this movie. When I walked out of it, I loved it. It's a Flash movie. Of course I was going to like it. It tells a story about Barry learning to utilize his powers with some responsibility. And that when you go to the past and change things, no matter how many times you try to put the pieces back together, it will never be the same again. Ezra Miller's acting in this film is great, despite them being a Hawaiian terrorist. Respected or not, this is a love letter to the DCEU, replaying the first film, Man of Steel, and even having four of the OG Justice League members as well. Bringing in Keaton provided some fun and some nostalgia for the older audience, especially because he was trying and not phoning in a performance. The emotional moments hit as well when Barry has to say goodbye to his mother, but the fact that this basic Flash story took nine years to be made is awkward because every Flash story is a multiverse story. And let me just say it, yes, the CGI is bad. I'm sorry, Andy Machete, even if you say it was intentional. It still looks like a PS2 video game. Kicking it off my top 10 list for me is Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, one of the better comic book films this year and the final installment to the DCEU. I feel like Jason Momoa just wanted to have fun in this film because he is not playing the same Aquaman from Justice League or the original Aquaman. It just seemed like he knew this was going to be his last time playing the character. Might as well just go full on Jason Momoa. And you know, I'm okay with that. 
I'm done with the DCEU. It doesn't make a splash into Uncharted Waters, but it is a worthy follow-up to the original film, focusing more on the brothers this time around. And they're better together than he and Amber heard. If the first film worked for you, this one will for sure work for you. It feels like this movie could have been two things. A drama about Arthur being a father, but also the king of Atlantis, the father on land, the king in sea, or the buddy cop comedy that we got. And I think both lines up well with the revenge of Black Manta. I would have loved to see the drama, but what we got is good too. I applaud the cast and crew, and even James Wan, for making a somewhat cohesive film with all of the shuffling behind the scenes with DC Studios emerging, the merger between Warner Brothers and Discovery and James Gunn and Peter Safran just completely canceling the DCEU and focusing on their reboot. All in all, I really like this movie. Number 9 is Blue Beetle. Speaking of films that I really did like. It's Blue Beetle, man. I got more excited for this film when they announced that it wasn't going to be an HBO Max original but a theatrical release. And man, is this movie charming. The greatest thing about this movie is the family. They are the MVPs and a major player in helping our protagonist find his purpose in becoming Blue Beetle. I just made a video about Blue Beetle, and I've said this is DC Spider-Man almost. There's a theme of choice and responsibility here. Likewise, our love interest character has more ties to the protagonist than just the scarab, such as the themes of wants versus what we have. I think everyone who watched this film can contend that it's actually pretty charming. In a year of multiversal stories and big CGI comic book films, this one stands out as one of the most personal and low scale. Eight is Batman vs Superman the Ultimate Edition. I haven't rewatched it theatrical, even though I can. I have the steel book, so I can rewatch it theatrical anytime that I want. But yeah, I've, I only rewatch the Ultimate. Look, I understand this movie is polarizing. Even the Ultimate Edition is polarizing. But man, I love this film. I really do love this movie. I've always said this. This movie works more as a Batman film than a Man of Steel sequel. Rightfully so. I think Zack Snyder actually works better as a Batman director than he does as a Superman director. Even though I really do love his take on Superman. But I just think that if we could have gotten a Zack Snyder Batman film, I think it could have been the perfect Batman movie. Ben Affleck's performance as Bruce Wayne is my favorite Batman. His performance is one that has history behind it and he's grizzled and old but also his rage is just justified the central plot about how the introduction of superman is the most important event in history and how the world sees it and especially how individuals such as batman and lex views the event up to this point warner brothers was all about a cinematic universe so it was clear that they kind of wanted nothing but justice league setup so clearly in the movie there's a bunch of Justice League setup, and while I love this film, the setup is just apparent. Even though we always blame WB for the cutting down of BVS in the theatrical cut, I think we can also put some blame on Zack Snyder, because there was just too much in this movie. You're trying to tell the story about how the world sees Superman, the politics of that. And then you also got Batman's rage. And then you have Wonder Woman put into the mix. You have the Lex plot. Then you also have Doomsday and the death of Superman thrown into the mix. And with Batman, you want to do Dark Knight Returns, kind of. And then you also have Justice League setup. I'm pretty sure most of what WB wanted was just the Justice League setup and just shoehorning in Wonder Woman. Where are all these other plot lines coming from? Like Sean Chandler says, this film is ambitious, it's just flawed. Number seven is Aquaman. From the moment I saw that trailer in July 2018 Comic Con, I knew this film was gonna be fire. Same with Venom, same with Shazam. I knew those movies were gonna be fire. And for me, everything just worked, man. The hype was on December 2018. Jason Momoa's charm is just entertaining to watch. The movie, of course, has this corny, cheesy feel about it. And to be honest, it's what makes me love this film even more. Aquaman is a cheesy, silly character. And I applaud James Wan for taking Snyder's serious take and turning him into his own without losing the serious DNA of the character. The story is very reminiscent of Black Panther, of course. I mean, they both came out in the same year. They're both talking about kings and successors. We're location hopping and James Wan had this dynamic way of filming action that allowed us to see everything. He zoomed the camera back, but you do kind of get a little bit dizzy. An Aquaman movie should have never made a billion dollars. But Jason Momoa and James Wan both crafted a fun film that made a character wearing an orange and green fish suit with a golden trident. Epic, but also cool.
Number six is Wonder Woman, another film that just shouldn't work. But damn it, Patty Jenkins comes in clutch, crafting a film with all of the dramatic moments of war without losing the hope of the character. Showcasing a story about how someone raised in love and compassion views man's inhumanity to man. Gal Gadot just has this charm about her. And while fierce, there's this naivety to her that makes her nurturing in a sense as well. I, I love the fact that they took this movie seriously and actually had faith in this. And well, it's not all the way perfect. What knocks this film down a bit is the final act. It's well documented that WB wanted a huge CGI battle in the third act. So the Wonder Woman vs. Ares big CGI fight comes out of left field. Beyond the final act, the war setting boasts a serious atmosphere that allows for the filmmakers to showcase just how powerful she is. And man, this is why Wonder Woman is my favorite female hero. This is why Wonder Woman is in my top 10 favorite superheroes of all time. This movie is why Gal Gadot is my celebrity crush. Kick it off my top five list for me. It's got to go to Peacemaker Season 1. I think we're getting to Season 2 or it's just going to be called another thing, Peacemaker or something. So I don't know. Look, it's a pleasant surprise for me. I hated the idea of this spinoff. Don't get me wrong, I love John Cena, but dude, Peacemaker was such an unlikable character in the Suicide Squad. Almost to the point where it's like, why would I ever want to watch a TV show about him? And then the trailers released at DC Fandom, and then the clips came out, and, and I was just completely turned off. But once I watched the first episode, I was hooked on the show, man. Let's get straight to it. The alien story with the butterflies isn't the best, but the characters and the interactions are what makes this show special. Taking an unlikable character and making him likable is James Gunn's M.O. And he was able to make me cry from an eagle hugging a person. The character of Peacemaker takes the line from the Suicide Squad said by Rick Flagg to heart. Peacemaker. What a joke. And tries to be a better person by the end of the series because he knows that he himself is a horrible person. When are people going to stop doubting James Gunn? This show is different, but also fantastic. And I hated every single thing about it before I watched it. Number four is Shazam. Just a refreshing little comic book film. Zachary Levi is the best thing about this movie, doing a great job playing a man-child in a way that's entertaining and hilarious. The novelty of seeing a child turn into a man with the power of the gods is something the second film was missing. Besides Zachary Levi, the next best thing about the film is the heart. It's essentially about finding family. There are some tonal issues. This film may fall into the horror category at times, but there's a reason why this was my favorite DCEU film for years. I love this movie, and when the emotional moments hit, they're also resonant. Kick it off my top three list for me is Man of Steel. It's either this or Shazam that's always at number three. I think this year, this film just has to be number three. I think it's because I watched this one recently, then Shazam. As a Superman movie, it's satisfying to finally see him fly around in a realistic setting and punch people in the face. This movie makes Superman cool to me. Everything that I think Superman is and should be is inside of this film. Beyond the epic action, the story is just so ambitious and how they take the character of Superman and put him in a post 9-11 world how is he different how does he change America how how does his introduction change the world Zack Snyder makes Superman into an actual human being giving him a dilemma that every man has what is our place in the world what are we here to do he's torn between his life on earth versus his heritage this grounded take is so interesting because it is different, but it also wasn't meant to start the DCEU. It was just trying to tell an individual story about one man and his journey. Man of Steel has the greatest comic book movie score to me, a damn good satisfying ending, and it is, if not, my favorite Superman story on screen. Our runner-up at number two is The Suicide Squad. This is James Gunn Unleashed, man, a film that really shouldn't exist. But man, am I glad that it does. This R-rated film lets the team finally live up to their name. Because we have deaths after deaths that line up with shocking to straight up emotional. Because for the most part, 
we really do like these characters and James Gunn does a lot to make us love these characters. James Gunn does it again in this hyper violent version of the Guardians of the Galaxy by making you laugh, cry, and feel scared for each and every one of these characters. Throughout the entire movie, I was on the edge of my seat wondering which character is going to die. Is it going to be Harley Quinn next? Is it going to be Rick Flagg next? Well, it's Rick Flagg. I didn't think Peacemaker was going to get shot or have the potential of dying in this movie. But when he got shot in the neck, I was like, well, how is the spinoff going to work? I was anticipating at any moment just somebody just dying. And man, while it's not a good feeling, it's also a pretty good feeling while you're watching a movie like this. Even after two years, this is still a bold, shocking, chilling film for the comic book movie genre. I'm so glad it exists. My number one is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Speaking of films that I'm so glad exists, is it's just this movie, this cut. I would literally say the only problems here are, is the hype. The It definitely outsold this film and just the overall four hours. It definitely could be shaved down to like three hours and 25 minutes or three hours and 15 minutes. Definitely some of the slow-mo could be shaved down. There are some unnecessary scenes here, but I'd be lying if I didn't say some of the four hours and the hype was, wasn't deserved. This movie benefits from the four hours by telling an epic story that spans centuries. Once you finally see what Zack was trying to accomplish, it kind of makes Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman better. Every single thing in this film is better than the theatrical cut. And every single arc has setup and payoff in the film. Like I said, this movie benefits from the four hours. We're introducing three new characters. And throughout the entire film, we can kind of see how their journey kind of lines up with Batman and Wonder Woman. And it all ties around Superman. My question is why? Warner Brothers what was so bad about this movie that you brought an entirely new director with a different style in to rework the movie to make it more Avengers level it doesn't have to be Avengers level that was the best thing about this movie is the fact that it's not the Avengers Zack crafted a huge sweeping superhero epic that involves mythology and heart that embodies DC and what it stands for the symbol of hope in Superman his death is what reignites the age of heroes again. Continuing the theme of Superman is the grandfather of all superheroes and his introduction is the most important event in the history of the world. This is a cut that's great in many ways. This is why Zack Snyder's Justice League has to come in at number one. All right, guys, that is it for the ranking. Please know that everything that I did say in this video was just my very own opinion. My list was certainly not the right list. It was just my list, and you were free to comment down below your very own ranking of all of the DCEU films ranked from the worst to the best, just like me, or you could just do your favorite. This is the last DCEU, like, ranking. I'm, I think I'm going to do some more, you know, DCEU content, but as far as just DCEU, period, this is the last ranking because uh, I really don't see any reason to do another one of these like in a couple of years maybe I'm gonna talk about these movies again but I'm not gonna you know do another ranking and such and uh you guys can check out that Twitter that link is in the description as well as that DC playlist that link is also in the description as well and with all of that out of the way guys like comment and subscribe and I will see you all next time have a Merry Christmas everyone